Hello and welcome to episode two of Good Morning Lancaster. We've got loads planned for today's show, including the news headlines and an interview with Baroness Varsi on Faith in Britain. We also sent some of our crew down to the Lancaster Music Festival this weekend to see what was going on. And Lusu Vice President Union Development Damon Fairley and Bowling College President Lee Dudding are joining us to talk about tomorrow's Union Council. We're back in the studio with today's show. It's already week two of term and time is flying by. It certainly is. Every week there is something big happening either around town or campus. Last weekend's highlight was definitely the music festival. Yes, Lancaster Music Festival has been running since 2009. It, it had 18 venues. This year there were 44 venues hosting over 200 performances from local, regional, national and international acts ranging from folk to punk, electronica to bluegrass, pop indie, funk and rock. Some of the student acts performing included Battle of the Bands winners BC555, Rosa Francesca, the Ele Electronic Dance Music Society and Alex Vary, who will be catching up with us in Sound Booth in the next couple of weeks. We sent a couple of people down there to catch the excitement and this is what we found. We're here in front of Lancaster Castle celebrating the Lancaster Music Festival, a four-day music festival with over 200 acts ranging from folk to electronica. Let's see what's happening. Okay, we're here with Chaz Amblo. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on at the Lancaster Music Festival today. Well, my uh, involvement with the Lancaster Music Festival is I got this stage, the melodrome behind, uh, and we've managed this this morning to set it up. It <laughs> took us an hour to get it in, but uh, once we got it in, it was fine. And we put on music. Uh, the melodrome was actually made in Somerset by a dear friend of mine called Dave Panett and uh, another friend called Mike Begg. Dave Panett's the best sign writer in the country for my money and this is th his uh, masterpiece. How long have you guys been a band together? Uh, it's been about two years, hasn't it? About one year. Yeah, one, one to two years. One to two years, fantastic. Um, and what are you guys going to play today? We're going to play. We're going to play one of our originals and uh, two covers by uh, some ska and reggae bands. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Okay, I'm here with Lucy, the coordinator for the outdoor space at the Lancaster Music Festival. Uh, Lucy, has the has the festival been a success thus far? Uh, we think it's been a success so far. We've had, I think, already about 40 hours of live music, um, and we've got hundreds more hours of live music to come. So it's been a long time coming, and everybody's really worked really hard for this. So it's great that it's going off and the sun's shining. Fantastic. How many venues are hosting musicians? We've got 43 venues, indoor venues, um, that's pubs, about 40, 40 pubs. And we've got the brewery, Lancaster University and Barclays Bank as well. And then in addition to that, we've got Sun Square, Market Square and Alton Square. And we've also got a street theatre festival running and obviously the castle. Fantastic. Uh, do you have a personal preference? A personal favourite musician so far? Oh, that's a really good question. I've really enjoyed the band on the dray, on the back of the horse and cart on the dray. I thought they were fantastic. I think it was great in Mumford and the festival coordinator, Ben Ruth. That was great. Thanks so much. And that was Lancaster Music Festival. Now it's time for some of this week's headlines. The VP Campaigns and Communications has said that Lusu is likely to support the NUS's free education demo. Ronnie Rollins has said that because none of the three main political parties were pledging support for free education, students should lay down their own demands on the matter. The NUS's demonstration will take place on Wednesday, week 7. Members of the University and College Union committed to strike on Tuesday, week 2, over continuing discussions regarding fair pay. 
Members of the union have also threatened to take part in an exam and coursework boycott following the release of a report on Monday Intro Week revealing that staff members could be set to lose tens of thousands of pounds from their pensions. It's currently unclear what the decision's effects will be at Lancaster. Lusu has successfully gained a place on the I Heart Consent pilot scheme. The campaign will see the NUS and Sex Fashion UK come together to deliver an educational programme aiming at facilitating conversations about consent on campuses across the UK. Lancaster is one of 20 universities and colleges to join the scheme. Green Lancaster coordinator Darren Axe has hailed summer 2014 as the Exodus Project's greatest success to date. The project reused 44 tonnes of unwanted student household items by selling them to local charities. However, Axe had said that the project only scratched the surface of the amount of waste generated on campus, suggested that the project could do with more resources. Only one college principal and only two student representatives will be taking part in the upcoming review of the colleges. Files College Principal Frank Waring will be taking the strategic lead on the review, while President Laura Clayton and VP Union Development Damon Fairley will be sitting on the review panel. Other members of the review panel include Provost the, for the college's Professor Amanda Chatwin. The University and LUSU have launched their Just Play initiative aimed at getting more students involved in physical activity while at university. The announcement comes after Lancaster secured a £240,000 grant from Sport England. Students can now take part in sports ranging from swimming to archery to wheelchair basketball for a fee of £1 per session. And that's about it for this week's news. We are now joined by Jack Perry, Scan Morning, Editor, guys. to discuss some of those headlines. Indeed, yes. I mean, it's been, as, as the headlines have, have shown, quite a busy quite a busy week in terms of goings-on, both for the university and for uh, Lucy, the union. Um, most notably, of course, we've got the, um, the free education demo that the NUS are organising uh, for sometime in November, which, um, the, which Lucy are... I think uh, going to support, and we may, and Lucy may be sending some uh, some students down there to support uh, the demonstration. There's been, uh, um, I mean, obviously the Union Council papers came out uh, over the past couple of days, and while there were, while there won't be a vote, or does, does, there doesn't p appear to be a vote on whether Lucy will support um, the the demonstration, the decision seems to have been taken by senior officers, uh, the full time officers that. Uh, Lucy will support the free education demonstration. This seems to be a very different situation um, from the one surrounding the last general election. Mm -hmm. We're moving into general election period now and there was the, the well-known Lib Dem pledge that mm. suddenly um, doesn't seem quite so sincere um, that they would protect tuition fees and it's almost like it's a, a topic that they don't that no party wants to touch. Mm, definitely I think I mean obviously before a few years ago, it was as much venting anger at, at the Lib Dems for breaking that pledge. Now it's almost uh, an admittance that none of the parties are actually pledging free education anymore, and this is something that the NUS, I think, probably wants to get back this idea back into the headlines, back into the sort of public consciousness. Um, so yes, and, uh, and I mean as. Um, uh, Vice President for Campaigns and Communications, Ronnie Rowlands, has said Lucy equally has this similar pledge to free education, which would make sense for them to to support this this demonstration. But on the on the other side, it is, I guess, a shame that none of the uh, none of the actual political parties are even contemplating free education. Is that because it's no longer what they see as a, a major headline grabbing issue? Or is it because any news is bad news? Because Ooh, it's going to go become more expensive. Yes, I mean definitely. I think, I mean obviously, there's the fact that uh, students, uh, compared to other demographics, don't tend to vote as much. So um, pledging free education wouldn't be as much of a vote winner as perhaps a lot of other policies aimed at other demographics uh, would be. And equally, I mean, in terms of being seen to be economically competent and things like that, perhaps introducing free education may be seen as 
uh, a vote loser in terms of not being seen to be handling the deficit and other other things like that. Um, but uh, as far as students are concerned, it is it is a real shame that none of the parties are even sort of contemplating this this pledge. Um, um. Moving on to a different headline, mm. the rent fees are something that everyone's thinking about coming into the beginning of first term. Can mm. you tell us a bit about what's happening? Yeah, definitely. I mean, rent fees, I mean, uh, particularly campus rent fees, uh, have increased year on year. Um, it's something that, and I mean, you find this, you know, across the board, whether it's in more standard accommodation, whether it's on suite accommodation, catered accommodation, all of them seem to rise year on year and it's I mean it's it's particularly for students who you know are dependent on student loans or will have to you know get jobs to fulfill their um, living uh, standards and things while at university um, um, it, yeah, so. yeah sorry because even over the couple of years I've been here I've seen it really expand the, the price but you've been here for a couple more yes. years, mm. so can yeah. You tell in us what? this is this is my seventh year, and I have lived on campus every year actually. Mm. And I have noticed that now I'm paying, I think almost exactly the same for on for standard accommodation that I was paying for superior en suite back Gosh. in 2008. It's gone up from I think it's about 96 pounds a week is what I was paying for um, en suite in my first year, and now I don't know what the current figures for en suite are, but mm. I, it's significantly over 100 pounds. Um, yeah. for that um, and it's it's a lot of money and it's it's a it's above inflation increases every year is this being driven by local factors and the university or do you think it's being driven by wider factors because some of the accommodation is owned by the university whereas a lot of it is actually run by UPP isn't mm, it yeah definitely I mean obviously Lancaster has won all of these awards in terms of their accommodation, so it's seen as the best. And I guess if that's the case, you would expect to pay the most for that accommodation. However, it does seem as if, particularly in terms of the accommodation run by UPP, that perhaps more local factors are, are coming to play. Uh, I don't know what's, what, the, what sort of figures um, are like, for example, in town, what, what the, whether there's quite a stark difference between um, the rent fees at the university compared to those in town, in Bowerham, and and even in sort of uh, more um, places like City Block and Chancellor's Wharf, it's it's yeah interesting. I mean, I don't understand how they justify increasing the price every sort of couple of years mm -hmm. when nothing is actually changing within the accommodation, or very little is changing within the accommodation. Well, exactly. I mean, it's. It's something, I mean, I guess the, the thing is, a lot of students um, only stay on campus their first year, they may come back for their third year, which means that, you know, those first years, you know, who, who are coming this year, for example, they don't know any better. You know, there's, there's, you know they, they, they didn't know what it was like four years ago or, um, or something like that. So it's, it's, it's almost, you know, they're playing on people's ignorance almost. There seem to be two issues here. Yeah. There's, firstly, there's the fact that they're going up above inflation mm, every yeah. year. And you're having rent increases of, over the time I've been here, I think you're looking at about £30 mm. a week, which is a significant amount of money. And then you're also having the issue of, it seems to be the gentrification of, of campus. Mm. There's very few of the, what, we would call lower end rooms uh, left now. With they've refurbished so. most of Bowling College, County and Grisdale have had the townhouses for a significant amount of time. Yeah. All of the southwest accommodation, apart from a few blocks in Grad, I believe, are superior mm. on suites. Definitely. But the interesting thing is that those accommodations are actually widely popular, and also the ones I know that uh, across in Lonsdale, I had one fresher to an entire house, mm. and there were many rooms empty. And they're the ones at the higher end costs. Yes, I mean, w I mean, a lot of university policy seems to be uh, having a negative effect on actually filling a uh, in filling campus accommodation. That's got a, uh, a range of a range of issues uh, attached to it. But um, but yes, I mean, the the lack of this lower end uh, accommodation. I mean, we've just uh, Bowen Dannex, I believe, is is 
are being refurbished now. So it's oh, and I mean I, I know a lot of students who um, wouldn't be able to have uh, you know afforded uh, anything above uh, you know the sort of Boland standard uh, standard flats. So it, it it could have quite a detrimental effect on on people who wanted to come and study at Lancaster. I suppose it just forces people out to the town. Well, definitely. Do you think it has an effect on the colleges? Because there are some colleges, Lonsdale, Cartmel, who only really have one type of accommodation mm. and it's, it's fairly expensive, whereas some of them have much more of a, of a mean, variety. I mean, it, it, it can. I mean, the, there's obviously, I guess, the, the starkest example is, is Pendle, where you have uh, two, you know, almost, you know, two very different uh, commonly uh, known uh, as uh, ghetto and posh uh, although indeed. ghetto ironically has been refurbished over <laughs> well, the last exactly. summer so I mean you've you've got as much geographical and sort of in terms of the room room types as well differences um, so I, I think in that sense I mean that that doesn't to me have a particularly unifying <laughs> Factor for that college. Um, I actually lived in in Posh Pendle for for three years. Really? I can say it definitely, yeah. if it definitely doesn't, because it's the part of the geographical yes, distance and, yeah. and the accommodation. Definitely, but I mean, on the other hand, um, you know, some people are more likely to uh, buy lower uh, lower end accommodation. Some other people, some others are more likely to spend money on higher. Uh, priced accommodation and if you've got that all uh, in the one college then you've got a bit more diversity in that college so you know I, I, I know for example um, perhaps Boland or, or uh, where you've got a, 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 where, or at least you had a more variety of, of accommodation that can or I mean Boland's one of the sort of yes. more uh, cohesive yeah. colleges so it can have a, a, sort of, uh, a much positive more positive effect on that so well thank you very much for joining us no today worries. and for working on the news <laughs> yes it was interesting to look through the second edition of scan on friday we sent chris down to the priory to talk to an important political figure who visited lancaster last weekend and was giving a talk yes i interviewed baroness varsi former chairperson of the conservative party after she spoke about faith in the community Baroness Varsi, thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Today you spoke on, on religion and faith in the community. How important do you think is, it is that we remain in, in uh, we have a constant view of faith in politics and in the wider community? Well, as I said in my um, speech today, I felt that it was important for faith to have a much more comfortable spa uh, space in the public sphere. And certainly one of my roles in government right from the outset was to make the case for faith in the public sphere because faith has been making, um, being part of the, the debate and bringing forward the solutions to society's problems for thousands of years and it seems incredibly unusual that we can come to a point where any um, debate f which has a faith perspective is seen as something that shouldn't be in the public sphere. Um, I wasn't saying that faith should have a unique uh, position or a veto position but it certainly should be an informer of the debate. As part of your talk, you advocated the organised state religion, the use of faith schools, and religious tolerance. Now, some people view these as incompatible elements of British society. How do you reconcile those views? Um, I think, look, if we find that um, providing that we, we all believe in a set of values, which is what we've sometimes defined as British values, some people define them as values based upon religious principles, then it's, I think there is a space both for um, uh, faith schools, providing that they're not used, as I said in my Q&A session, as a way of separating out communities, but are genuinely a space of learning where their, their minds are broadened rather than narrowed. Um, I'm a huge supporter of faith schools but so one of the things I would dearly like to see is faith schools which are multi-faith faith schools so that you have all the advantages of a faith ethos but still have all the advantages of mixing with other faith communities as part of the learning process. Do you think that universities and schools and other education establishments have a duty to ensure that religious freedom is not only taught but there are examples of religious freedom within, with religious tolerance within every single 
educational establishment? I think there has to be um, a very strong um, uh, support for religious freedom within all schools, faith schools and others. We live in a world where we are constantly in contact with people of different faiths. Uh, the world is becoming a smaller place, whether that's in relation to learning or trading or travel. We cannot exist where we hold these bigoted, isolationist views where uh, effectively we're constantly feeling like a person of another faith is a threat to ourselves. As I said in my speech, having a strong faith should give you that strong sense of identity which should make you more welcoming of the other, not feeling threatened by it. And keeping on the subject of young people and faith, we are constantly he hearing stories of the radicalisation of young people, whether they be British Muslims, American Christians or whatever. Do you think there is an inherent danger in introducing young people to religion in an age where the internet materials are at least as available, if not more available, than any local faith community? Well, one of the biggest challenges um, for radicalisation is that it's not that we have too much faith, it's that we have too little faith. Uh, quite regularly you find young people who have been radicalised have been taught a very narrow sense of faith. They don't appreciate the, the diversity of even their own faith, irrespective of their, di their diversity that different faiths uh, have to offer um, and and I think what is important is that we have good scholars good good teachers good vicars people who can both inspire young people but also teach them the fundamentals of a faith which which fundamentally all faiths teach people to live together in in harmony I think the the challenge we have is that where religious leaders fail to attract respond um, feel like they are um, somebody that young people can go to are not available to have those discussions then of course they look for alternatives including alternatives on the internet where things aren't explained in a contextualised way, a literalist interpretation is taken of certain things and then used as a justification for committing terrible, terrible acts. So for me, I've always said that you know one of the reasons we have radicalised young youth is not because we have too much religion, but because we have too little religion. Now, alongside talking about faith, you did talk a little bit about politics today. You have a different relationship with the British public than many politicians, as you are a peer and an unelected politician. Do you feel it's important to come out and talk to people in situations like this and other situations because you don't have your own constituency? Well, to? interestingly, I think what my resignation taught me is that I have a huge constituency. It's not a geographical constituency. It's not all based within three miles of where I live, but actually it is spread across the United Kingdom. And the number of letters and emails and messages that I had at the time of the resignation made me realise that there were many, many hundreds of people in this country who held the same views as I had. I loved these, what I call the church hall, the town hall type meetings. I did many of them when I was party chairman, less of them when I was foreign office minister because I was constantly on, on planes. But having an opportunity like this, especially to have a QA and a session, I think is good not just for, for people to engage with issues, but I think it's good for politics as a whole. I think we, we are seen as politicians as distant uh, out-of-touch Westminster village types and I think when we come out into real communities and people communities have a, an opportunity to question you and get to know the real you I think that's not just great for you as an individual but it's great for politics as a whole and talking about the Westminster village and the the attacks on the idea of, of the established parties there's been two very different demonstrations of British democracy in the last month we've had the Scotland referendum which has seen a huge turnout and a vote in favour of the establishment with keeping the union, albeit with some devolution. And we've seen the by-elections in the last week, which saw a very low turnout in comparison, and UKIP winning one seat and coming within a hair's breadth of winning a second. What do you think this says about British democracy? I think this is great for democracy. I think it shows that people are becoming engaged in politics in a very different way. I mean, of the two by-elections that you mentioned, the turnout certainly uh, in Clacton was very, very high, much higher than an average by-election. The by-election, I think, in Middleton and Haywood was much more like a, a by-election. But the turnout in the Scottish referendum engaged young people, it engaged people it had never engaged before. You know, I'm delighted that in the end, Scotland decided to stay and we're still a union. I am a unionist. Uh, but I also think that it was an important moment when people could have those debates. And, you know, the, the fact that in some countries around the world, when they have, when a certain part of the country wants to split away, 
they have wars, they, you know, they kill people, they have the most awful uh, protracted um, uh, violence that goes on. The fact that we could have these debates robustly, passionately, um, have a referendum, that's, those are the signs of a great grown-up democracy and, and the fact that people still believe in, in that system of, uh, of, of uh, governance. So I think it's been a great time for, for politics and for turnout. But like I said before, it is our job as politicians to make sure that we keep coming out, we keep reaching out and we let people see us as the human beings that we are. And finally, with the general election coming up in the next year and the role of younger people, especially in the, in the Scotland referendum, how, how important do you think young people are going to be in this upcoming election? Um, well, I know certainly here in Lancaster, uh, you have a member of parliament, Erica Laurentshaw, who's very connected to uh, the university and to the young people in the constituency. Uh, I would like to see parliamentarians connecting with, with young people. Um, it's a fact that young people are less likely to vote. That therefore means that parliamentarians focus on those people who are more likely to come out and vote. The referendum showed that young people were courted much more because they were, they were going to come out and vote. So I think really the power lies in the hands of young people. If you vote and you want to be taken seriously, you will be taken seriously. And I would urge you to, to go out and be part of, uh, w of what is going to be an incredibly important general election. Baroness Arzi, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And it is certainly interesting to hear her views of what to expect at the election and the importance of young people. We'll of course be following the build-up to the election closely next term. As a democratic organisation, LUSU has many different committees and groups which debate and decide policy. The most important of these is Union Council, which meets four times per term and sets the political agenda for the Students' Union. The members of council are made up of college presidents and cross-campus officers, but any student can attend and contribute to debate as an observer or submit a motion for discussion. Despite the open invitation and importance of the decisions made at council, which affect every aspect of Luce's operation and political agenda, very few students attend. To explain what Union Council is and why it matters to all students, we're now joined by Damon, VP Union Development for Luce, and Bolland College President Lee Dudding. Damon and Lee, thank you for joining us. Can you explain who sits on council and how it fits into Lucy's democratic structure? Yeah, um, well, where it fits into our democratic structure, as you say, is our most important policy-making body. Um, so, if basically, if any students or any officers want the student unions to take a certain policy on something, for example, free education, um, want to mandate us as full-time officers um, to do anything, sort of. Uh, campaign wise that's where you would take it to Union Council in the form of policy and once it's gone through Union Council and voted for we, we then have to do it because that's what we've been told to do for students. In terms of its membership um, it comprises of all the six of the full-time officers, all the cross-campus officers, um, all the college presidents with one of their vice presidents um, and who else have I missed off? The heads of student media. That's it, and the heads of student <laughs> media. <laughs> we're we're well, not that important. Um, we also have a group of six um, LUSU councillors that are elected purely to sit on LUSU council. Um, so if there's any students watching that want to get involved in LUSU council but don't necessarily want a, quite a lengthy job title essentially, LUSU council is a perfect position. Could you tell us a bit more about what sort of decisions LUSU council can make? Yeah. Um, well, I suppose the big one is Lucy Council decided to support the um, strike action that we've had recently um, in Lancaster. Um, so the Student Union officially supported that on behalf of students. That all came for a Union Council. Um, free Education Union Council was supported. Um, we've also passed um, policies just on things like free drinking water across campus um, to be able to eat and drink in the learning zone. So you can see sort of the range of decisions vary quite a lot from stuff that's quite small like being able to eat and drink in the learning zone to big national issues like um, pay for members of staff at the university. So the council papers and agenda are released a few days ahead. They're released on Monday for this week's meeting. And there's a few different items on the agenda. First up, we have a motion on swearing in council. Have either of you got any sort of uh, insight into why this has come before council and what's, what's the reason behind this motion? First. Well, the yeah, reason first. the reason we've, it's been brought to council is because people have expressed they dislike the idea of swearing in such what's meant to be a professional environment. It's meant to be a policy making body, and it's something that observers are invited to attend. So people do think it's unprofessional that there are members of that council that choose 
to swear instead of expressing themselves in more polite terms. But surely that kind of thing goes without saying. Is it really necessary to make <coughs> that statement? Th this is the debate, essentially. I think there's two competing sides to this argument, and we've had the debate amongst us as FTOs. Um, there's one side that I very much agree with that says your Lucid Council is an extremely important meeting of the student union. Um, if anyone that knows me knows, I do swear, um, but I pick and choose my times. The union council is not the place to swear. It makes certain people feel uncomfortable, yeah, and for me, even if it makes one person feel uncomfortable, we shouldn't do it. Um, so I think the very fact that we're having to put it on the agenda as a discussion item to, for council to actually say they don't want people to swear in the meeting, I think is wrong. We should just take it as a given, like you say, that people and shouldn't swear. I mean, it's time being used talking about something that should probably go, um, rather than talking, discussing <coughs> something maybe a bit more important, do you think? Well, this is actually why I'm so grateful LA1 is actually talking about this to students because at the end of the day, like we've said, Union Council is extremely important. We can, make, we can make decisions that affect the entirety of campus and all students at Lancaster. And when you look at certain things on this current agenda, you could argue whether these are things that students want us to be discussing. Should we have sort of 50 officers of the Student Union in a room talking about whether we should be allowed to swear or not? Or should we be talking about issues that are really affecting students, such the as the College of this, Review? This yeah. seems to be strange to me because the person who will be in charge of enforcing this is the chair of Union Council. And of course, the outgoing chair is still in charge of this meeting, Ronnie Rowlands. But there is going to be a new chair elected. So it, it seems interesting to me to put this up at a time when the person enforcing this is going to change for the next meeting. Yeah, uh, just one small thing on that. I actually think Ronnie's made the right decision. Um, he is the current chair of council. There's been a disagreement on this issue, so what he's actually said is we'll just put it on the agenda um, for council to actually just take a decision on it. So I think in this instance it is the right thing, and I don't think he could have done anything else really, so he has made the right decision there. Um, but just like I said, I think it's we don't, the discussion we shouldn't need to have in the first place. One of the other motions coming to council this week is a discussion of Lucy's ethical donation and sponsorship policy after the Rugby League Club offered a sponsorship deal from accountancy firm KPMG. Can you tell us why this particular issue is being brought to council? Well, Lucy passed policy earlier this year where we said we'd keep an eye out essentially for unethical sponsorships. Uh, so when this came to us, uh, it came to the Lucy Executive Committee, which is a meeting made of the six FDOs, three cross campus officers, and three college presidents, and they meet once a week and they pass things like sponsorship deals. Um, and this came to us as a executive committee, and it said, if it, the argument was that this went against the ethical sponsorship policy, which we'd already passed. But then the argument was there was, there was a, a lengthy debate about it with one side saying that this is going as policy and that's why we shouldn't pass it, and other people saying this is useful money for the actual society and we should be in place to do this for the students. So after a lengthy discussion where we didn't really have uh, a consensus, that's why it's come to council. Now, Lusu already has a relationship with KPMG. Not only is it one of the biggest graduate employers in the country, it is the auditing company for Lusu. Um, so does it seem to be hypocritical that we will buy professional services as a union off this company, but then when they are offering to help with a substantial amount of money, £1,000, to uh, one of the sports clubs with no major strings attached the, from seeing the contract, the only thing was to have the KPMG logo on the kit, which is a pretty standard sponsorship offer, that we should be turning this down. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, but w this, this decision was actually taken with KPMG in the building doing our own audit. So, um, <laughs> it's, What's next door you were discussing? It, yeah, <laughs> I think, as Lee said, we have this ethical investment policy, which I absolutely support, I think, but maybe the reason it's come to council is we need to narrow down sort of actually what are our, are, are our criteria. Because I think, as you say, for me personally, KPMG, they're a massive graduate employer. They're offering £1,000 for actually just to have KPMG on a kit. It's a very good offer. For me, I don't see a problem necessarily well, with it. Not so. only that, they committed these crimes over 10 years ago, I believe, and have paid substantial amounts towards mm. fixing that. Well, I mean, look at all the people we currently have sponsorships with. We have sponsorships with lots of businesses in town. Uh, we, don't, I mean, we don't know what all these businesses get up to. So, I mean, if we apply it in this instance, I think there's lots of different situations where actually we're, we, we could be showing double standards, and I, I think... Yeah, is this any less ethical than having a sponsorship deal with a nightclub mm. who 
let's face it, are throwing drinks offers out there mm. and deliberately trying to get people drunk to earn money. And there are loads of nightclubs in town that do sponsorship. And it, it seems to be very strange that this is... Mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a very wide spectrum of, of what is ethical and that sort of stuff. I mean, notably in a time where... Just drawing some figures here from the Sugar House, between t t 2012 and 2014, there's been a drop, uh, sorry, a profit drop of 63%. So how can they then take the liberty to refuse donations? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's a case that we've, we obviously, Lusu is experiencing slightly difficult times in terms of we, we have less money than we've had in previous years, meaning we have had to cut certain budgets. And we have offers like this coming forward that are very good offers, but we're saying no. And I suppose my final point on it as well is, for me personally, I trust those elected executives of clubs and societies who look, take these sponsorships, uh, to me it's up to them whether they deem it as ethical. If they think it's ethical, they want it for their club, they bring it to us and only in exceptional circumstances should we then as a central union say no. And I, and I think that's why it's important we're having this debate so we can clarify what we actually mean by what is our ethical investment policy. Now it says in the exec minutes <coughs> which are handed out with the council papers that some of the FTOs expressed the view that they would, the club would probably take the sponsorship anyway and that this sort of bureaucracy is a reason that clubs don't bring sponsorship to Lusu all the time when they're supposed to always bring it. Does this show that clubs and societies are fed up of the bureaucracy and so beginning to become out of Lusu's control on this matter? <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> question, isn't it? Um, yeah, you could interpret it like that. I mean, I don't think, I think a lot of people see Lusu as quite bureaucratic. I certainly did as a college president. I don't know what you think of that, Lee. Yeah, there is certain red tape that's sometimes hard to get past. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. I think the sentiment um, some of the FTOs they were trying to express, I may well have been one of them, is, well, I think I was actually, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that there's only so far we can go. We don't have any ways of actually enforcing this as such. I mean, if we want to enforce this, that's something our activities department would have to look quite strongly at, and in particular the vice president of activities, Salman, needs to look at this. Because w if we're going to set this policy and we're going to say no to certain sponsorships, if we then can't enforce it, all we're doing is alienating clubs and societies from the central union. We're here to help clubs and societies do well. We're not here to sort of put lots of red tape around them and say, we're, we're sort of, we're, our morals come above yours if you know what I mean. Is there a danger of clubs and societies seeing as Lusu as an irrelevant body? Because not only have you said that you're in danger of alienating them, but this is being brought to a body which has no direct representation from clubs or societies. There are There is an, a full-time officer activities and a cross-campus officer activities, but they have a very wide remit. There is currently no one on council who is there to represent clubs and societies. Yeah. And does that mean that it's going to lead to clubs and societies thinking that this is an irrelevant body and we will just ignore it? Well, I think we, we've already mentioned that union councils are open for everyone to attend. And when items such as this are being discussed that directly affect certain students and certain student bodies, I'm sure that people like Damon would strongly, strongly encourage, and I would too, for those people this is affecting to come in and observe, because you can speak. When we're discussing this, there's no reason why the um, club can't put their hand up and say, oh, well, we think this, and that could affect the vote union council takes. So in that sense, I would really strongly recommend that's where students start getting involved in union council. The other thing that's relevant to this is there was discussion at the end of last term, um, before you came into office, mm -hmm. um, about club and society representation on mm -hmm. council. Uh, do you think it's important? I know both of you came from the JCR. You're a JCR on it because you're a JCR president. Yeah. You have been on council as a JCR. Do you think it's important to widen the membership of council outside of the JCR and cross campus? Officer the remit. Absolutely. Um, it, it certainly was a discussion we had last year. Um, it's about, as we've discussed, Union Council sets the policy for the entire union, so it needs mm -hmm. to have proper representation from the entirety of campus. I mean, there's lots of different areas we need to increase representation, in representation on, for example, post grads, all these sorts of people, but also activities. They have, a, in terms of their voice on council, I think two officers, did you just say they have? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the equivalent of one college delegation on council. We need to look at increasing that. Um, yeah. There are people who <coughs> replace their effectively replace their college with societies at, Un at Lancaster, and although the the college system is there to represent everyone, there are, I would say, a significant number of people who their primary interaction interaction with Lusu is through their club or society. If you look at the number of club or society exec members, they will far outnumber cross campus officers and JCRs put together. Yeah. And do you think that this is one of the 
causing the factors that causes people to say that Lusu is either irrelevant or is a closed clique. Yeah, it, I think it's certainly a contributing factor, and also on on the sponsorship thing. Um, this year, we've made a very conscious effort. A lot, I know a lot of staff members have put a lot of effort into this in terms of helping clubs and sites to get the sponsorships in the first place. And we've seen a massive increase in terms of the amount of sponsorships that are coming to Lusa Executive for approval, meaning all the deals are above board. We can help them get a good deal. What's happened before is everything happens under the, under the table. So clubs and societies would get the sponsors still, but they, do, they didn't have the safety of doing it through Lusu, meaning we can actually administer it for them. So there's no sort of risk on their part. And we've increased that. And then all we've done by this, in my view, is started to alienate those clubs and societies again. And we'll just get back into the situa situation we were in that we don't actually know about any of the sponsorships in the first place. And I think that's the biggest shame about all of this. Are there any actions that are going to take place to, to move towards this, do you think? I think this is a good start. We're discussing it in council, and we're actually going to decide, hopefully, what what how we narrow down this policy and how we can then apply it. Because if we have clear direction on how to apply it, that's fine. We can then do that. But I I, I think yeah, I just think we need we need to speak to clubs and societies and just just and then outline what that policy is, the reason why it's there. And we need to go out and actually educate people about it rather than just say no to things. Because I mean, imagine how annoying it would be as to say if LA One got a sponsor. Um, you put so much work into it, you didn't get any support from Lucy for that, came to, came to us and we just said no. It, it wouldn't make you feel any better about the student union, would it? Exactly. So. No. Is increased representation for clubs and societies still on the agenda, do you know? It, well, it is for me. Um. <laughs> I think, well, towards the end of last year, we obviously we introduced uh, three new liberation officers, which was a step in towards increased representation on council and, you know, there's no reason why that can't continue because it has been mentioned that perhaps that's a reason why people do view Lusu in this negative way. So if we're, if we're moving towards an area where Lusu are looked upon as being representative in the, at least most of the student body and people aren't looking at it in that way, then I think it's a good move. But what's interesting as well is we don't, we don't necessarily have to solve this issue by putting lots of new people on to council. I mean, you, we can look at it in terms of saying, is this decision a decision that union council should be taking or is this a decision that perhaps activities council should be taking? We already have a council full of all the, cl all the clubs and societies, so maybe we just need to look at delegating more powers over to that council rather than filling this one up with just more members um, when actually a lot of these things on here might not actually be relevant to those members. Okay, I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Well, thank you for joining us, guys and explaining about something that a lot of students don't really typically engage with. That's all we have planned for this week, but we have loads more planned for next week's show. Don't forget, Good Morning Lancaster will be airing every Wednesday at 11am. Thank you for watching. And we hope to catch you on LA1TV. Bye.